Now it's time for us to take a look and to listen to the second lesson today from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Let us hear now the good news. <clears throat> On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine? Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of our Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Clive Staples Lewis, better known to the world as C.S., was a 20th century British novelist, academic, literary critic, as well as lay theologian and Christian apologist. He held teaching positions at both Oxford and Cambridge universities, but is probably best known for his fanciful forays into theology, like the Screwtape Letters and the Chronicles of Narnia. As it happened, Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, who of course wrote The Lord of the Rings, were close friends. They both served on the English faculty at Oxford, but important to this sermon were part of an informal discussion group with a few other academics that met weekly at a pub in Oxford and who called themselves the Inklings. There, over pints of beer, they would talk about literature and they would talk about God and sometimes how the two overlapped. Think the Scapsy Pints group here, y'all. At the time, Lewis was a religious skeptic, actually, a lapsed Anglican, he had even toyed with atheism. He writes about himself at this time, quote, you must picture me alone, night after night, feeling, whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, feeling the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. But then in the winter of 1929, a change came upon C.S. Lewis. This is what he writes. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England so this is Lewis' state of being and mind when he was meeting with the Inklings at that pub. He was a, a confirmed deist. But then at the age of 32, during a late-night walk with Tolkien, he took the final step. He came to know God personally in Jesus Christ. He described the experience as being, quote, surprised by joy words which became the title of his most famous theological work. When you have an encounter with God, he said, you have no choice but to be grateful. 
What else can we say to what God gives us, writes Karl Barth, but stammer praise. There is an insistence in Scripture, particularly in the Psalms, to remember and to praise God, to be thankful. You see it all over the pages of God's Word, but especially in the Psalms to be grateful, to praise God. Why is this there so much of the time? Because God wants us to be this way, because God commands us to be this way, perhaps. But I think there's a better reason. We are taught to be thankful, to live lives of gratitude, because it's good for us. Lewis goes on, I noticed in the reading of Scripture, when I would read Scripture, how the humblest and at the same time most balanced minds praised the most. While the cranks, misfits, and malcontents praised least. I, I've seen that in my 34 years of church work as well. The happiest people are always the most grateful. They just are. They're not naive about their situations nor unrealistic about their lives. Things don't always go their way. They get sick like the rest of us. They suffer. They face tragedy. They have hard times. It's just that they don't get stuck in their suffering. They eventually move on. They focus on God's horizon of hope and they walk ahead and they are grateful all over again. I guess you could say that in a sense their default program is gratitude and they always reset to it. Christians, disciples of Christ, beneficiaries of what Jesus called the abundant life understand this truth. At any and all times, they not only have enough, they have more than enough. How can we then keep from singing? And when we do, we feel good. Praise is not only the most basic human response to God, but it is also inner health made audible. G.K. Chesterton, the redoubtable English writer who was also a major religious influence on Lewis, said this, gratitude is the highest form of human thought. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Happiness doubled by wonder. And in this regard, G.K. Chesterton actually took pity on the atheist. He went on to say, the worst moment for an atheist is when he is really thankful and has no one to thank. Gratitude is where spiritual life begins. And Luke is the only gospel writer to get this, evidently. Luke is the only gospel writer to include the story that we have before us today. Matthew, Mark, and John don't have it. Luke alone has this story about the lepers and Jesus. Jesus and company, as you heard, are walking to Jerusalem in the region between Samaria, Samaria and Galilee. Now, right away, there is a flag, and it's Samaria, a big red flag. Observant Jews did not go anywhere near Samaria or Samaritans. Samaritans were a despised group, culturally inferior, theologically heretical. But when you think about it, they're all... Jews, the people from the south, the people from the north, at one time they were a united kingdom. It's just that Samaria was conquered by Assyria and was taken away in exile. And the two parts of that one family, the Hebrew family, were broken apart. And now they look askance upon each other. How can that be? How can there be such negative thoughts about someone who is really part of the family? 
But it's really not that shocking when you think about it because we Christians do this all the time with other Christians. Think of the enmity between fundamentalist and mainline Christians and vice versa. What about the lingering antipathy some of us have toward Catholics? We have no reason. We have no reason at all to be smug as we read about this Jewish Samaritan antipathy that's part of this story. So, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples encounter ten men with leprosy. Now, we think we know everything about leprosy. Those of us who have grown up in the church, we've heard stories all of our lives about lepers. There are plenty of other Bible stories that have leprosy as a feature. But it really is hard to describe the social alienation and isolation that lepers experienced. People lived in absolute dread of the disease. Everybody thought it was contagious, which is why lepers lived in total isolation, banished from their families and their homes. Think about that. From the loving touch of spouses, children, and parents. Banished, separated from families, from community. They lived alone in colonies, banding together in their ministry. And they were ordered to shout, unclean, unclean. Except today they shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us when they see Jesus coming. Now, you will notice that we're not given an act, actual description of the healing. Uh, as, as the lepers were on their way to show themselves to the priest, we are told they realized that they were, quote, new and clean. New and clean, made well. Y'all, this is the root meaning of the important theological term salvation. Salvation, to be made well. Salvation comes from the same root, in fact, as does the word salve, healing ointment. Or at a party when you make a toast, salute to your good health. Salvation. These men literally and figuratively had been saved, made well. And if we get nothing else out of today's sermon, please get this. Salvation means healing. But there's a bigger point to this story. Jesus saves, yes, which is the heart of the good news of the gospel, but also at the heart of the gospel is what people do in response to their being made well. As it relates to these lepers, nine of them kept right on walking. Only one stops in his tracks, runs back to find Jesus to thank him. That it was a Samaritan, the least likely to do such a thing according to conventional wisdom, makes it ironic and even more dramatic. Where are the nine, our Lord asks. But then he says something very interesting. He says, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith, gratitude. Could it be that Jesus himself is saying that people of faith are intrinsically healthy people? Does this man's gratitude have something to do with his well-being? Is there something life-giving about gratitude? Recently, I ran across an article entitled, Boost Your Health with a Dose of Gratitude. The essay cited thousands of years of philosophic and religious teaching urging gratitude, and then cited some new evidence that grateful people for whom gratitude is a personal trait have a health edge. There is actual evidence that gratitude alone is a stress reducer, that grateful people are more hopeful people, and that there are links between gratitude and the immune system. 
Remember when our mothers made us write thank you notes? They were doing that for our own good. There is something life-giving about gratitude. When you and I make our pledges to the church, let us do so not out of obligation, but out of gratitude to God for all that God has done for us. Everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. What remains for us, however, is its converse and how we complete it. And it goes like this. For I so loved God that I gave what? Grateful people are giving people. There is something life-giving about a life of gratitude. It happened every Friday evening, almost without fail, when the sun resembled a giant orange and was starting to dip into the blue ocean. People called him Old Ed. Old Ed came strolling along the beach to his favorite pier. Clutched in his bony hand was a bucket of shrimp. Ed walks out to the end of the pier where it seems he almost has the world to himself. The glow of the sun is a golden bronze now, and everybody's gone except for a few joggers on the beach. Standing out at the end of the pier, Ed is alone with his thoughts as if he's been transported to another time. There he stands with his bucket of shrimp. Before long, though, he is no longer alone. Up in the sky, a thousand white dots come screeching and squawking, winging their way toward the lanky frame of old Ed standing there on the pier. There, before long, dozens of seagulls have enveloped him, their wings fluttering and flapping wildly. Ed stands there tossing shrimp up into the air to the hungry birds, and as he does... If you listen closely, you can hear him say with a smile, thank you, thank you. In a few short minutes, the bucket is empty, but Ed doesn't leave. He stands there lost in thought. When finally he turns around, he begins to walk back toward the beach. A few of the birds hop along behind him until he gets to the stairs of his home and goes in. Now, if you were sitting there on the pier with your fishing line in the water, Ed might seem a bit peculiar and odd. To onlookers, he's just another old codger lost in his own weird world, feeding the seagulls with a bucket full of shrimp. Old folks do strange things, at least in the eyes of younger generations. Most of them who watched him probably wrote him off, old Ed off, down there in Florida. That's too bad. They'd do well to know him better. His full name? Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. Famous hero from both the World War I and World War II an ace pilot. On one of his flying missions across the Pacific, Eddie Rickenbacker and his seven-member crew went down. Miraculously, all of the men survived, crawled out of their plane, and climbed into a life raft. Captain Rickenbacker and his crew floated for days on the rough waters of the Pacific. They fought the sun. They fought sharks. Most of all, they fought hunger. By the eighth day, their rations ran out. No food, no water. There were hundreds of, they were hundreds of miles from land, and no one knew where they were. They needed a miracle. That afternoon, they had a simple devotional service and prayed for one. They tried to nap. 
Eddie leaned back and pulled his military cap over his nose. Time dragged. All he could hear was the slap of the waves against the raft. Suddenly, though, Eddie felt something on top of his cap. It was a seagull. Old Ed would later describe how he sat perfectly still planning his next move, and then with a flash of his hand and a squawk from the gull, he managed to grab it and wring its neck. He tore the feathers off, and he and his starving crew made a meal, a very slight meal for eight men, but they made a meal, and then they used the intestines for bait, and with it they caught fish, which gave them food and more bait, and the cycle continued with that simple survival technique they were able to endure the rigors of the sea until they were found and rescued after 24 days. Eddie Rickenbacker lived many years beyond that ordeal. He went on to become president of a major American airline, but he never forgot the sacrifice of that first life-saving seagull. And he never stopped saying, thank you. That's why almost every Friday night he would walk to the end of the pier with a bucket full of shrimp and a heart full of gratitude. There is something life-saving about gratitude regardless of one's circumstances. In the mid-1600s, Europe and especially Germany was plunged into a 30-year religious war. A young man named Martin Rinkert was pastor of a Lutheran church in Eilenburg, Germany. Famine and deadly disease raged through the land. The population of Germany went from 16 million to 6 million. In 1637, Pastor Rinkert conducted funerals for almost 4,500 people who died in an epidemic that swept through his city. He was the only surviving pastor in the city. The grave diggers refused to dig graves because of the disease, so Martin dug many of the graves himself, including that of his beloved wife. Now then, how could a man so be so deluded as to think that in the world of his day, torn to shreds by war and disease, Christians would still have cause to give thanks. We need not diminish his grief or gloss over the horrific things that he experienced and in the midst of which he sought to minister. And yet, and yet, he was still moved to give thanks. In the middle of it each day of that wretched time, he remembered the generosity of God. Yes, the providence of God. He remembered Jesus Christ. He remembered the Word made flesh. And gratitude bubbled up with joy within him. And he wrote these words. Now thank we all our God. With heart and hands and voices the words to the last hymn that we will be singing today, written during that time. As we leave worship today, may you and I be so stirred by those words and the story behind them that we will in all times and in all places remember to be grateful May we count our blessings that we break through the thin membrane of sourness and sullenness and walk through the gates of thanksgiving and into fields of joy. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing and bountiful life. And forgive us if we do not love it enough. Amen.